Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to NZ, the title series of Bioshock Infinite. I am Zauberhaft, all yours as always, coming up with a final word which has become a tradition already. Yeah! Well, you know that perfectly well if you are watching this after having the pleasure of watching the whole series of Bioshock Infinite on my channel. Huge thanks to you guys. If you haven't yet, then thank you nevertheless for dropping in. Well, just go ahead and choose a couple of episodes to enjoy. First of all, because the game is damn awesome. And second, the trick is that this episode is not this final as it may be, since the whole Burial at Sea story is still ahead. So let's just call it the bonus episode where I'll be talking less of my likes and how I love this awesome game and more of the intricacies of the plot, details on characters and unexplained twists, stuff like that. Well, at least that's what I am planning on. I've been playing Bioshock Infinite for the second time now and my personal interest was to get into the particulars, explain stuff and find proof for my findings. So now that I officially state that the case is closed, here I come with a report in the form of a free monologue of a sort like this. Of course, I'm saying that on a spot, so I do apologize for stumbles and everything. So the case Booker DeWitt, character analysis, the way I view it. The first person, Mr. DeWitt, also known as the False Shepherd, the protagonist in this case, and its greatest twist. May be accused of child trade and numerous murders, by all means armed and dangerous. Other persons involved, Zachary Comstock, the Prophet. The would-be villain, a parallel version of Booker, accused of murders, racist violence, planning and organizing of an act of terrorism, warmongering, excessive religious propaganda, kidnapping, torture, and massive brainwashing. Extremely dangerous, and the list is probably not over yet. Elizabeth their daughter. <laughs> yeah, just don't let your thoughts carry you away into the abyss of ignorance. I'm guessing she is Booker's daughter, but to Comstock, he, she is uh, she's not, because uh, Comstock is not her biological father anyway. But other another version of his is the biological father, and Comstock only bought her. Also, I called her Liz or Lizzie or the goddess of time and space throughout the playthrough. No explanation for that. She is just definitely the victim here. Lady A. Comstock. Just remember that the Banshee's first name begins with the letter A and nobody actually explains what the name was. Wife of Zachary Comstock, the Siren, of course the victim in this case, the Lutes twins, Rosalind and Robert, the quantum physicists and the true masterminds of the whole this chaos and somehow the victims as well may be accused of a murder committed in a publicly hazardous way, which I will explain a little later. Daisy Fitzroy, the leader of terrorist rebels, the Vox Populi status in this case is yet unclear, accused of making up a rebellion, or working up the rebellion as you may say, maybe rightful, maybe not, it was a terroristic operation anyway. Jeremiah Fink, an entrepreneur, the richest businessman in the whole city of Columbia I guess, and his list of charges is just terrible. He may be accused of murders, enslaving, fraud, drug dealing. He's the first accessory of Zachary Comstock. Extremely dangerous, cunning, and definitely the man not to be trifled with. And finally Cornelius Slate, the veteran of Wounded Knee, the protagonist's friend, would-be friend, not sure, a definite side casualty in this game. Accused of armed seizure of the state property. 
I'm guessing he's just a uh, support character here. Definitely his role was not that huge as that of the previous characters I have already named. And the list of minor characters will cover the whole library if every person killed during this investigation is in this list. So uh, I'm guessing that amount of characters will suffice for now. Let me dwell a little on each of the mentioned persons, and to do that, I'd come back to my fluctuation bifurcation theory. If you have not uh, got this yet, I advise you strictly just to go there and find the uh, episode which is called Tears Explained. I, I believe it is uh, number 14 or something. So, uh, you will see how actually deep and philosophic this game is, how deep its philosophic part is. The way I view this game right now, there is one man, one space-time line, one sequence of actions. Then, speaking with the words of Andrew Ryan, a man chooses, a slave obeys, and each time a man makes a choice, there is a split in the sequence. Everything that the choice affects changes and the rest stays kinda the same. These are the constants and variables, the lutesses we're talking about. The problem is we can't really understand the exact amount and the nature of things affected by our choices in the most variable sense. Sometimes even uh, in the end of our life we cannot understand what choices I actually changed our life and what choices did not make any difference because it's just uh, not the time it's not just the city the door or the tear as you may say the other people's actions are also taken into consideration random and sudden things and accidents also are taken into consideration like multiple threads forming the complicated and intricately sewn carpet of time-space flow. If you got the metaphor here, the ocean that Rosalind Lutes was talking about with not a single but multiple flows going in various directions due to various factors all at once. This is really difficult to percept with uh, one mere human brain. Time is more an ocean. This is the philosophic grounds for the plot of Bioshock Infinite, and this is what is supposed to be taken into consideration while even trying to follow the plot. Now, armed with this theory, I can go on. Since the uh, relative uh, middle of the game, up until the very end of the game, I was asking the same question, kind of, uh, to myself. If there was a tear in the way to Columbia, maybe somewhere in the sky, maybe somewhere in the trajectory of the rocket Booker was traveling in, the answer is a lot worse than just yes or no. It turned out all of a sudden, <laughs> the guys, you know, with Bioshock Infinite, it is just never yes or no. It's just too simplistic to uh, even be present in this game. The way I see, Burkers got into a time-space loop. He tried to finish this job a good lot of times, failed a lot of times, started anew a lot of times. Almost in the very beginning of the game when Booker first sees Comstock on the screen and he hears him say, It always ends in blood, doesn't it? But then again, it always does end, doesn't it? Booker's nose starts immediately to bleed. And this is how you know Booker's already dead. And it's not the first time he is in this universe. It is not explained in the game at the moment, but now that I know, I kind of can recall this moment. On top of all this, I remember the initial conversation between the Lutesses about the experiment that nobody starts already knowing it has failed. 
One goes into an experiment knowing one could fail. One does not undertake an experiment knowing one has failed. It seems a little bit out of place and out of time. Nobody can understand why they are speaking about something actually no one can freaking get the meaning of. As soon as Booker comes to Colombia, everybody speaks about the notorious false shepherd that somehow turns out to be Booker himself. You might ask the question, how the hell people know about this again? Booker must have already traveled in this particular universe. He must have already been there and must have already done a lot of stuff to make all the people understand how dangerous the false shepherd is. Now, would you get that brand, boy? Don't you know that makes you the backstabbing snake in the grass, false shepherd? And now I know that this kind of supports the idea that Booker DeWitt has already tried starting this anew, has already tried a lot of times. During the game, Booker never travels through tears until the moment with the dead gunsmith. But actually, hey, just look at it. It doesn't say he never traveled through tears prior to the moment the game even started. So, uh, here... What remains to be seen is the true meaning of the epigraph. The mind of the subject will desperately try to create memories where none exist. That's why he doesn't remember his previous travels, minus those where he died. Whoa! <laughs> it did kill me, finally! Well, first of all, I tried to explain all this uh, with uh, the time travel. Well, in game, Booker never traveled back in time through tears. All by himself. He was teleported six months into the future, then he saw New York with the help of Elizabeth, I mean New York on fire, in the future of the future, and then returned immediately back to the present, at the very moment before Elizabeth got indoctrinated and intoxicated or whatever else, so he didn't have to create memories. He didn't have to do that, or at least that seemed to him so. He had already made memories already as they are. If a person gets into another universe, not just back in time, the past changes as well, but the memory doesn't. And if it doesn't fit into the reality, it forms a cognitive dissonance. So everything is okay when you remember stuff like uh, the chest of drawers being closed and now it is open in a new reality, but if your brain experiences something terrible, some suffering or death, this may lead into a lot and a lot different consequences. Now, let's see here. According to Lutesis, the brain starts to adapt as soon as it encounters information that conflicts with the current memory or reality. Well, Booker and Liz teleported into the world where the Vox got the weapons and Booker sees the banner with his picture, the hero of the Vox, and immediately his nose starts to bleed because it remembers death. <laughs> Not the nose, the brain of course. Uh, no big deal, you know, uh, this dissonance leads only to the bleeding nose because the death happened long before in time and his body was in good shape at that particular moment, but I suppose Booker would be half mad and if his brain had to adapt to the memory of death that happened a mere couple of seconds or minutes ago when the feelings of death are still fresh, he would be donezo by that time and I think I have found the answer to what happened to those guys vanishing and yelling something after I saw them alive just having killed them in the previous reality. I mean, those uh, that looked like uh, badly transmitted holograms trying to yell something out. Stinking two things, but I only mean one of them. Since Booker and Liz did not exactly go through the tears, Liz just amplified and widened the size of existing tears. It might have covered the bodies of the killed soldiers simultaneously with us. Well, their bodies got teleported through the tear to the world where they did not die. And here's the interesting fact. If the brain can still think, as they say, like uh, seven hours after death, it means their bodies were dead. 
but their brains were not, and the memories were not lost either. So see what happens. The brain adapts, still not dead, but on the way to dying in its feelings. Its thoughts are inserted into a sane body. That is possible if the tears teleport not just objects, but most importantly, information. This is what I have already said throughout the game a little bit, and now I'm returning to this thought. So it was a non-fitting chunk of memory inserted into their brains, and it resulted in this kind of thing. Split personality, split reality perception, and God knows what else. You can think about it yourselves if you want to. I can even assume that all this reality tier business is about information a lot more, actually, than just objects. Which is seen in the episode with the siren. She's kind of the brightest example of it. Lady Comstock was coined of information pieces rather than of uh, some physical matter of a sort. Perhaps you will listen to your mother. Of course, it all comes from the assumption that information is relatively tangible and appears another variety of energy or something. Well, I. I I am not this much aware of this theory as I should be to actually percept the uh, plot of this game properly. So things we see around are but very concentrated chunks of information. It reminds me of uh, Platon's theory, Platon's theory of ideas. In brief, which is there are ideas flowing around we can catch with our heads, with our brains, and there are exact things that represent those ideas. The version of these common ideas, rather. With the siren, the information was taken from the original lady's past, but as well it was taken from Elizabeth's memory, from her feelings towards her mother, and random pieces of info already existing in the current universe irrespective of possible dissonances. That's why she was lured to the remains of her memories that were scattered around in Emporia. I think she's... I think she's a combination of herself and my feelings towards her. Apparently, this sort of thing happened with Booker as well. Each time he traveled back to the beginning, erasing all he has done, and trying to start anew, correct possible mistakes, all in vain though, I, uh, he joined Slade but he was likely killed in Hall of Heroes, he flew away with Elizabeth and the First Lady but the songbird tracked him down, he joined the Vox against Comstock but Elizabeth was transported into fortified Comstock house and indoctrinated. Or DeWitt was killed during the siege maybe, yeah, this version of his could not have even returned to the beginning. And I'm guessing, in Bioshock lore, if one goes back in time to replay the whole set of actions and correct the mistakes, right the wrongs as a real self, starting from the place and time he or she has already been to, it's like taking control over your former self and act differently all the way, and not just change a couple of certain things getting back into the future. The previous version is overwritten. The body, the actions, the consequences as well, yet the memory in the subconscious remains the same. And, well, the pieces of it remain in there, even though the actual events this memory represents are already non-existent. Here it comes. Here, here comes the explanation. Probably this is the very explanation for the epigraph there. Some memories, as a result, do coincide with the previous version. Some don't. Some have the background and some no longer have it in the given reality. The causality connections in, in the brain get broken and it starts to restore them the way it can, making memories up where they don't exist. But I'm not ultimately sure. This is how complicated it is just to get it. 
it's not remotely self-explanatory in the game, so I apologize if I still haven't found a proper words to verbalize my idea. Thousands of doors. Stars. What concerns me, in the case of Elizabeth, I called her several times throughout the game a goddess of uh, time and space, or Dea in Latin, because being able to see through all the universe's probabilities and possible outcomes is basically a power that gives me a reason to call her, or any other person wielding such power, a god. The ability to teleport is but a fiction compared to the brain power of this person. That kind of brain can process this whole almost infinite amount of information coming from all the tears or at least capable of sorting it out. How else could she have found the tears necessary to get to the moment of Comstock's birth? How did she find the uh, rapture tear? And she could have found the rapture tear within like a couple of moments after regaining her full powers under the emotional pressure of the situation with the songbird that went out of control after destroying the siphon. Well, in my opinion, it takes more than a genius to cope with all this. I wonder if a human brain even has the capacity to do this. Maybe it has, but anyway, it requires a great deal of training. By all means, among the characters, only Comstock and Lutesses had the access to tears and were able to see through them, artificially though, unlike Elizabeth, but still. Well, this, in my opinion, makes Comstock either a complete dumbass, or he simply looked only into things he cared for and never actually paid attention to side effects of his actions. A true leader, huh? <laughs> or maybe the game wants us to see that this is a kind of a human nature to actually pay attention only to the things that matter to us and kind of neglect everything else. Well, nevertheless, Daisy Fitzroy, for example, is one of the greatest mistakes of Zachary Comstock, in my opinion. The Vox line, by the way, is not that simplistic in the game. Lady Comstock, she even had a kind word now and then. Almost enough to make me think I had a place in their world. Scullery maid was what they called me when I walked into Comstock House. Murderer was what they shouted when I ran out. Sure I got that Zachary Comstock used Jeremiah Fink to kill his wife and put this all on Fitzroy. So uh, she worked in Comstock's house and of course it was so easy to blame everything on Oriental population of Colombia. It was so typical of that time or uh, beginning of the 20th century. But I think it was the bad mistake once again even for a racist. Colombia runs on these people. To offend them is to take the batteries out of the flashlight and expect it to work somehow. So, Comstock himself is to blame here. If he only could see it all through the Lutes device, or if he did pay attention, well, that could have run differently, by all means. As for Fink himself, that man is not that mysterious. All things considered, on the bright side, He's really productive, self-confident indeed, and very, very resourceful. But on the dark side there? Oh man, this, this part has just the entire list of terrible crimes. What is the most admirable creature on God's green earth? Why, it's the bee! What? Have you ever seen a bee on vacation? Have you ever seen a bee take a sick day? Well, my friends, the answer is no. So I say, be the bee. He, he's so self-oriented, cunning, merciless, cynical, mercantile, and absolutely non-caring for others. Wow, <laughs> with, with such a bunch of traits, it makes him a perfect moneymaker and dirty dealer. 
Hey, you know, guys, need some dirty job done in a most clean way? Just call Jeremiah Fink and prepare to let alone your reachers. But, but you may be sure that the job will be done. Here's your slug, idiot. So he got rid of Lady Comstock and tried to get rid of Lutessus too. Lutessus, the bastard, is a creation out of her womb of some unholy science. The lady couldn't accept the child. She couldn't accept her husband's sterility. Couldn't even roughly understand the principle of the machine. I assure you, madam. My sexual interest in your dear prophet is non-existent. Furthermore, the man is quite sterile. Whoa! Yes, Come again, you little bastard! I want her out of my house! She didn't want to believe Rosalind. No wonder that was a great problem for Zachary Comstock and a definite motive. But hey, killing is not a way out. But an option still. Choose your soul mates wisely, ladies and gentlemen. That's the lesson. Or things like that may happen really, really soon. But it's all with her, I guess. Just too much ammo and too little understanding. And that's uh, all for Lady Comstock's crime. She's basically a victim in this case. Victim of her own husband. Comstock has sabotaged our contraption. I can Yet, see that. We are not dead. A theory. We are scattered amongst the possibility space. It was not that easy to cheat on Lutessus, though. Foolish it is to think they wouldn't guess. He didn't even get busy to think over this. Especially being Prophet and everything like that. Or maybe he actually didn't have access to those devices and used them only for special purposes with Lutessus help only. I'm not sure. That's up to you to consider. Still decided to kill them, even though his reign rested on their scientific progress rather than looking for other means of influencing them. Yeah, that's where they said I'd find her. Huh? Telegram, Mr. DeWitt. And here are the consequences. These two resourceful minds, I mean the Lutas twins, sent Booker against Comstock under the pretext of stealing Elizabeth to actually get rid of them both. What was the actual goal of Lutessus then? To correct mistakes of their own, most likely. They trusted Comstock. They helped him. They gave him the whole amount of tools to commit his crimes. They thought Anna, aka Elizabeth, would be a lot better off with rich, faithful father Comstock than with a rush games addicted, marginal drunkard DeWitt. But who to thunk? So, uh, vengeance, of course, is a call, but most importantly, they wanted to stop the disaster, which they could not do all by themselves, as their device was uh, sabotaged and they were scattered amongst the possibilities, amongst the realities, I guess. How the hell they stayed alive remains an absolute mystery. And as well, the question remains how the tears work. I promised not to actually ask this question, but now that it comes to it, they aren't just teleportation rifts, for all I can conclude. They transport information in the shape of objects, persons and phenomena, and if the information comes into conflict with already existing things, it provokes a cognitive dissonance resulting in the critical state of the system, or, here we go, fluctuation. The bifurcations themselves may depend on the choice of characters involved, or just on pure luck, or bad luck, in this particular case. So what can we conclude from all this? Is the circle broken? What is the outcome? Yes, it is. Booker killed himself after the events of uh, Boxer's Rebellion, Wounded Knee and Peking, having not made the choice of his life and leaving Anna alone, I guess. <laughs> maybe. Or, or maybe it means that uh, 
one booker remained alive to look after his daughter. Or maybe neither of remaining bookers had this episode with baptizing in their lives and instead had different happier lives, which I think is exactly so. So it's somewhat a good ending after all. Maybe I have not mentioned something, but this is what I think so far. I know that there is a lot more explained in Burial at Sea, so I'm looking forward to it patientlessly. Seriously, man, this game is awesome. I, I, I wonder if it's even a good idea to insert this much philosophy into a video game, but this one is in no words a masterpiece, a pearl of video gaming industry, no doubt. Well, my personal special huge thanks to Ken Levine who has written this marvelous story. Man, you know, there, there are so many lines miraculously unwinding with each other. The plot tackles a lot of issues such as philosophy, religion, racism, family relations. God dang it, one can speak about Bioshock forever. And on the game detail level, it's so colorful in graphics, so expressive. More importantly, even the visual effects have actual meaning. Like Lady Banshee rushing back into Elizabeth, like returning to her mind. Tears opening around characters rather than Booker and Elizabeth just walking in them. And suddenly people around them turning into badly transmitted holograms, which has meaning that I have already explained all this. Man, I just didn't pay attention to it initially while playing the game for the first time, so for all I can say, it's not yet over, ladies and gentlemen. I'll welcome you all in Burial at Sea playthrough really shortly, and I just cannot wait for it, because a lot more will be revealed onto our eyes. Well, and as usual, I say, thank you all, a dead huge lot of thanks. Thanks for watching, stay tuned if you like my playthroughs, there are definitely a lot more coming with a sure consistent approach to all of them. Be sure you'll like them even more. I'm tracking my channel daily, I'm correcting a lot of mistakes. Oh man, I just remember being so dumb at the beginning of this playthrough, making a ridiculous amount of horrible spelling and grammar mistakes. My god, my English is sometimes the language I, I guess only I am speaking on the entire planet. Yeah, that's it. I do smell fishy. Nevertheless, I apologize for the probable drawbacks in my speech anyway. Of course, do feel free to leave likes and comments and be sure the feedback will come as soon as possible. Go ahead and leave your ideas, suggestions of improvement, constructive criticism, games you'd like to see or just say I am a complete psycho to have been talking for all this damn time. But man, I can do a lot more when it comes to Bioshock. And hell, I will! Always, any word from you guys is really, really welcome and highly appreciated. Whatever I'm doing here, I'm doing for you to enjoy, have fun and get something interesting on the way as well. So, you may always contact me if you will, for sure. Some co-op games, projects or whatever, I'm at your service. You may always find me on Facebook, on Twitter or join the brand new ANZ community as well. All the links are posted on my channel, you may also find them down there in the description. I hope you have had a nice time enjoying my investigation playthrough. Meet me in Burial at Sea. It was Zauberhaft the Mighty, here with title series of Bioshock Infinite. Remain this cool, guys! Love you all! See you soon! Signing out. This is fine, it's that one line I don't know. Yeah. Well, he'll figure it out. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. Went back home, Lord. My home was lonesome. Yeah. Went back home, Lord. My home was lonesome. All my brothers sisters cried. See, but then now it's too short. Now it's one too short. Because yeah, then it goes, what a home's up here.
We'll play it one more time. Went back home, Lord. My home was lonesome. All my brothers, sisters cried. What a home so sad and lonely. And then it's missing the next line. Um, that's what I'm saying, like, this is the second, that's the third, that's the fourth, but then... And I don't think that's supposed to say lonely. I'll play lonely. So sad. lonely. Oh, we're just missing one. We'll, we'll, we'll get the actual one. Can we run it through this video? There are loved ones in the glory Whose dear forms you often miss When you close your earthly story Will you join them in their bliss? Will the circle be unbroken by and by, or by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky, in the joy. Take the tempo down a little bit if we can, um, and sort of start by finding like Booker. If you could just be sort of like picking away at the beginning first, and then sort of start to play the song, and maybe then um, you guys kind of find the tempo together a little bit. Um, I want it to feel you guys are so excellent and professional. Yeah, no, it won't be like that. I, I, I want to make it sound like it's not like you know, Sheryl sure. Crow and, and um, right. Eric Clapton in a <laughs> session. Um, so he gets Eric Clapton, I get Cheryl Crow. <laughs> Who do you want, Jop? Right. Yeah, uh, Joplin. Uh, Next Tina. 
Britney Spears, and see you all.